Hello, I'm John David Ebert, and uh, right now what I'd like to do is to proceed to invent a new genre, uh, the online uh, or electronic autobiography. Uh, so what I propose to do here in a series of many videos uh, is to tell the story of my life uh, in chronological order, and what I would like to do is to organize it in terms of units of seven-year cycles, since uh, in astrology, Saturn squares itself every seven years uh, until it returns at the age of 29. It takes uh, 29 years to go around the sun. And every seven years, it causes a crisis of some sort, and it creates a threshold that has to be survived through somehow, uh, which I'm sure you will notice if you review the events of your own life uh, in terms of seven-year chronologies. So for this first episode, this first installment of the story of my life, uh, I would like to cover the first seven years, uh, where indeed a crisis did occur at the age of seven years old, a big one. Um, so there's that. And when one reaches a certain age, and this year I turned 50, uh, one begins to look back with nostalgia on one's life, and you kind of start to wonder uh, the path that you took, how it got you where you are now. And when you look back over it, certain macro patterns become clear, as well as certain micromolecular patterns, let's say to use Deleuze and Guattari's term, um, and it becomes interesting. You begin to see, like Schopenhauer wrote in his essay about uh, on an apparent intention in the fate of an individual, uh, the decisions that you make as you go along appear to be random and chance, but then you look back on your life and it seems to have the composure of a novel. It seems to, it has chapters and crises and epochs and things that happen that look as if the whole story uh, could be told as the composition of a novel. So that was Schopenhauer's idea and I think he's right about that. So what I want to do is start with my parents, of course, as every autobiography is supposed to do, and begin first with my father's family. Um, <clears throat> my father was quite weird, and his family was uh, quite weird as well. Um, they were a good working class family from uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, my grandmother uh, was a school teacher, an elementary English uh, school grammar teacher, and uh, my grandfather... Uh, was a very dark, moody, weird, creepy individual uh, that nobody in the family liked. And I never remember him being in a good mood or having a good word to say about anyone or anything. He was an auto mechanic, eventually owned his own tire shop in Phoenix. Um, and so I don't know much about uh, my father's side of the family. Nobody, it wasn't a type of family, unlike my mother's side, who loved to confess everything. Uh, my father's side was pretty tight-lipped, and nobody ever took me aside and said, oh, you know what happened, um, so I know very little about it. Um, but I do recall my mother saying a story, telling me a story about uh, the reason why my grandparents, uh, together with their two children, my father and my uncle, moved out to Phoenix. Uh, had to do with the fact, that apparently, that my father, as a child, burned down someone's barn uh, in uh, Pennsylvania. Now, when a child does that... Uh, that kind of uh, aggressive action indicates that the child is obviously being severely mistreated somehow, and it's an expression of anger uh, in response to the mistreatment. Um, so I'm pretty sure what happened, and this has been inferred in discussion with my mother, is that uh, my father was being sexually abused by my grandfather, I believe. Uh, he had lifelong sort of PTSD nightmares where I recall him would go stay at his place uh, and he'd wake up in the middle of the night and go running down the hall, uh, claiming that he had a, a roll of pennies jammed into his throat. We know what Freud would say about that. Uh, so I think that's what happened there. And one of the reasons why nobody liked my grandfather, and one of the reasons why my father uh, was such a traumatized uh, individual, almost in a permanent state of PTSD. Um, so that's that side of the family, and that's basically all I know about them. Uh, and then my mother's parents, uh, I know a lot more about because uh, my grandmother was very talkative and very gossipy and preserved things. Um, she preserved, for instance, uh, my descent from Native Americans. I'm part Cherokee, and it's well documented. Uh, she showed me actual photographs of the, t the two Cherokee people, a man and a woman that I'm descended from on that side of the family that they are descended from. And that goes through my maternal grandmother's line and her parents. Uh, but the man she married, uh, my maternal grandfather, this is my mother's father, uh, was a rocket scientist, uh, and he was a big deal. Uh, he was out in the Southwest um, during the whole explosion of the space age in the 1950s, going back and forth between 
uh, places in California, Arizona, New Mexico, uh, that whole space age industry, which he helped design and invent. Chuck Yeager was a guest at the house, on, uh, the guy who broke the sound barrier. You can see him played by Sam Shepard in the movie The Right Stuff. Uh, was often over at the house. Uh, he was one of uh, my grandfather's best friends. Um, and my grandfather designed all sorts of atmospheric rockets. And supposedly, according to my grandmother, he designed the, or at least did the completed design for the pilot's ejection seat. Other people had worked on it before him, but I'm pretty sure he gave the, he gave the, the final touches and sold it to the military. Uh, he doesn't get credit for it since he's, all he did was subcontract for the military. He came out of a military background. Uh, and his father, my great grandfather, was a military man who made it up to the grade of major, and he was a surgeon. And he was a surgeon in a mobile MASH unit in World War II. Uh, he saved a lot of people's lives, apparently, but he came out of World War II with very severe PTSD. Uh, my grandmother says at one point he was in a straitjacket in a hospital in uh, California somewhere uh, with PTSD. He tried to commit suicide by cutting his throat. Uh, a couple of times he tried to do that, uh, so he was very severely disturbed. But on the other hand, he was extremely highly functional and an overachiever. Um, he was known to be alcoholic, uh, would drink himself into a stupor every night starting at 5 p.m., uh, drink himself into such a stupor that he would collapse into his meal, and his uh, wife would carry him off to bed. But he'd get up at 5 a.m. the next morning, every morning, uh, to operate on someone. Uh, and he was winning awards. He had been uh, taught, at, he was a graduate of Johns Hopkins Medical School, one of the most prestigious in the country, um, just constantly in the newspaper, constantly accolades about him, my great-grandfather. He was apparently uh, a, a huge overachiever. Um, <clears throat> I found out through my karmic researches that apparently I am the reincarnation of my dead great-grandfather. Um, just a little juicy bit to drop that we'll get to later and find out how I figured that out. His father, in turn, was a newspaper publisher uh, in Decatur, Illinois, and his father, in turn, was, again, a doctor. Um, I don't know what kind of doctor, though. Um, so that's that line. Uh, coming down then to my grandfather and my grandmother, uh, the parents of my mother. Both of them now, uh, both are dead. Um, both of them were apparently extremely abusive parents to my mother uh, and her brother. And uh, I remember my mother telling me many stories about how my grandmother uh, would beat her routinely, very often with using a wooden spoon, uh, would beat her up quite a bit all through her childhood. And the grandfather was apparently just a, a narcissistic asshole, constantly yelling uh, about things not being in place. Um, he said the children should be seen not heard, um, and that was his attitude toward his kids, whom he apparently didn't like very much. He was not apparently a very loving father, from what I can tell, although he did have a pretty strong relationship with, with his son, my uncle. Um, but my mother said that um, her mother beat her all the way up to the period when she met my father one day. She was 18 and had just graduated high school and was really looking for an excuse to get out of that house. And when she found my father... Um, Apparently one day the mother got into the car with her and tried to attack her, and my mother just let her have it, just started whipping her and hitting her and slapping her, and my grandmother never touched her again after that, needless to say, after she stood up for herself. Um, and so those two parents were very abusive to my mother, caused her lifelong PTSD, all kinds of dysfunctions and all kinds of problems as a result of raising her in a very abusive uh, environment. In my, you know, my grandfather was making lots of money as a rocket scientist. He was the breadwinner. Uh, my grandmother didn't work. She wasn't particularly skilled or talented at anything. Uh, never really worked much in her life at all. She was just the beautiful trophy wife, I guess. She was a very attractive, dark brunette, Elizabeth Taylor-looking type. Um, and so there was that. Their marriage ended, uh, needless to say, at a certain point that we'll get to here uh, and a series of events that led up to his suicide, my grandfather's uh, suicide. Um, so, flashing back to my mother's childhood, she went to Arcadia High School, which is in Scottsdale, uh, during the 1960s. Um, she lived in the same neighborhood that the Spielberg family lived in, a few, a few streets down. They went to the same high school, and my mother used to hang out with Ann Spielberg. She would tell me about going over to the Spielberg's house and having fun with Ann and hanging out with her. I don't think she hung out with Stephen. Uh, he was a few grades ahead of her. I think he just graduated before that. Uh, but out of this matrix, um, my, she met my father, 
who was also attending Arcadia, and they met. And I guess uh, there are not too many virtues about my father that I can say, but I think one of them um, and that I inherited, I think, uh, is his sense of humor. My, my father was very, very funny, always making jokes. And I'm sure that uh, in her young mind as an 18-year-old girl, uh, this was the first man who showed her some attention and you know, made her laugh. So she's constantly laughing. And laughter is a drug, you know, especially to a young girl who's come out of an abusive uh, background in her family. And so they married. Uh, but my father um, wasn't particularly skilled either at anything other than uh, he was good with auto parts, which I guess he inherited from his father. Um, he was good with auto parts. And apparently, uh, so from what I heard, um, he had gone into the military um, around the time of the Vietnam War, but wasn't in Vietnam. He was stationed in Germany um, and were of German extraction on both sides. But both, both parents are uh, of German extraction, very strong Lutheran uh, German uh, world. And he was stationed in Germany, fell in love with Germany. He learned the language, uh, basically had a basic speaking knowledge of it. And he came back just obsessed with World War II. That was his primary obsession all of his life was World War II. He used to build models of battleships that you get out of plastic Aurora model kits. Some of you may remember from that generation and uh, some airplanes, but he was mainly fascinated with boats, battleships specifically, but also tanks. And he just kept making all these models, 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 models. And that was his primary obsession. And apparently he had only one job uh, for a while. He worked uh, in a machine shop and then he got fired uh, and then never worked again. After that, he refused to work, refused to get a job, refused to do anything to help out. Uh, so it's pretty much a dud, this guy. Uh, and he was very abusive uh, to me, an extremely abusive individual. Um, for the first seven years, what I remember is mostly being raised by him. Uh, my mother never seemed to be around. She was always elsewhere, most likely having affairs. I believe that she was promiscuous and she was out having affairs with other men uh, because this man was such a miserable waste of time. Uh, so that's perfectly understandable. And uh, but most of the time um, and she worked at uh, Motorola, which was an electronics plant up the street. Um, but my earliest memories before that, my earliest memories uh, come from living, uh, uh, the three of us living in an apartment, a very small, tiny apartment complex somewhere in Phoenix. Now, I have no idea why I incarnated in Phoenix of all places. It's a huge urban agglomeration. One of the, I think it's the sixth largest city in America, three million people, it takes two hours to drive from one end of the city to the other. It's gigantic, but it's totally empty, totally soulless, no sense of culture or art or anything like that. It's uh, Trump land. Basically, it's all golf courses and uh, shopping malls and resort hotels. I have no idea why I incarnated there, although uh, some of the spirits that I've interviewed suggested that it had something to do with me getting access to resources because I wanted to learn. Um, so I wanted to be in a place where access to resources was quick and immediate, uh, which it basically was. I suppose that's one of the virtues about Phoenix. But Phoenix is uh, it's a doomed city. Uh, in a couple of centuries, as global warming proceeds, it will become uninhabitable. The summers are getting hotter and hotter and hotter. And pretty soon it's going to be a ghost town. Give it give it two centuries from now. Mark my words. Nobody will be living there. It will be empty Mad Max looking uh, skyscrapers, totally d blown by uh, haboobs, gigantic dust storms, which are out there ruining the topsoils of Phoenix as they go blowing through. Um, it's a doomed place. Don't move there. Um, and the summers are awful, absolutely unbearable. So why I chose Phoenix, I, I don't know. But uh, so my earliest memories derive from <clears throat> living in this apartment complex. And I remember hating my father from day one. I remember I always hated him. He was always very severe with me, occasionally whacking me upside the head. Um, and he could turn mean on a dime. He had a personality. Uh, um, he might have been bipolar, but he was definitely paranoid. And he became paranoid schizophrenic as the years went on. The, the paranoia got worse and worse. Uh, and he could turn mean on you on a dime, just from a perfectly jovial mood. And all of a sudden he's mean with a really mean face and he's yelling at you, you know quiet, nasty, angry voice. I was terrified of my father as I grew up. Um, and I remember being alone and unsupervised in this apartment complex that we lived in. Uh, and I must have been three, four years old. And I was always out by myself walking around this complex, 
This was the days of the hippies in the early 70s. I remember doors were open, hippies would be in there getting stoned, and I'd walk in, and they'd go, where's your mom? Where's your parents? And I'd be like, I don't know. I'm just wandering around. So I was a neglected child and abused and totally unsupervised. I was always on my own, and I remember exploring fields. I remember going to Circle K, trying to buy candy with Monopoly money and wondering why they wouldn't accept my Monopoly money to buy candy, you know, <laughs> stuff like that. And so, you know, I learned a lot on my own, but um, anybody could have abducted me. I mean, it could have been a disastrous thing there. It just seemed like my parents didn't give a shit. That's pretty much the... The story of that, and I remember one day uh, crawling my way through a field that had barbed wire in it. And keep in mind, I'm like four years old here. And I'm crawling through this, and the barbed wire just tore my legs up. And I remember going back home to the apartment. My mother wasn't there, of course. And uh, my father taking me roughly, uh, exasperated with me, into the bathroom to wash off my stingy legs. And I still have scars on my legs uh, from the, that barbed wire uh, to this day. And, yeah, my mother wasn't there much, and she wasn't particularly lovey-dovey with me. Uh, she, I remember one time, uh, her sadistic delight that she took in uh, telling me that she was going to cut off my foot and fry it in a pan with some uh, peas and carrots, uh, and me being terrified by it and her laughing. Uh, she wasn't normally a sadistic person, but I do remember that, that aspect of her. She just wasn't there. She was just never around. That's the whole thing. And um, I remember her bringing my brother home from the hospital when I was four and her sitting there with him uh, saying, yeah, look, this is your new brother. And I, at four, I was totally befuddled. I had no idea what this individual was. And um, so those are the memories, the cluster of memories that I have from that first apartment. And from what my mother later told me, um, my grandmother was... Um, had given some money to uh, my uncle, uh, who later became a police officer in Scott, Scottsdale, a very functional, normal individual, pretty much, uh, except going through a few divorces, but otherwise pre pretty normal. And um, my mother called her up on the phone and yelled at her that, that, you know, she now had two kids and she's helping out the brother, but what about, you know, my father? Um, you need to help us out here because we're in trouble. The father won't work. He's not doing a goddamn thing. Um, now she's got two kids. So what do you, what's going to happen here? It's looking pretty grim. So my grandmother then, uh, to her credit, proceeded to buy for them a trailer, a, a mobile home uh, that existed out in front of a massive golf course in front of Papago Mountain. Uh, that's where we lived. And the trailer overlooked a desert in between the golf course and the chain link fence that separated off this white uh, mobile home uh, with desert ground. There was no grass anywhere in this park at all. It was all desert ground. Uh, that trailer park is gone now. There's, a, of course, a, a condominium development that's there now. But it was overlooking, and the same view can be found over directly overlooking uh, the golf course and the National Guard. And so military helicopters, Hueys, were always flying over uh, in formation, loads of Hueys, uh, which I always found really fascinating as a kid, looking at the helicopters and wondering what it would be like to be a helicopter pilot. Um, and that view... You can see the exact view in an Antonioni movie. I think it's Red Desert, if I remember right. It's either that or Zabriskie Point. It might be Zabriskie Point, where he put the camera somewhere there in that same area because he's got the exact same view of Papago Mountain and the golf course. Uh, that's pretty cool. So anyhow, um, so then we move uh, at about um, four, I think, uh, into this trailer, this unhappy uh, little family. And we moved into this trailer. And once again, my father did not work. He was always home, and his job was to, quote, watch me, which he never did, because uh, I was always out in the desert, wandering around, doing things. And I remember once hopping the chain link fence to get to the other side and finding a pack of matches and trying to start a fire to burn down a mesquite tree that was there uh, with a cushion at the base of it. I was trying to burn the whole tree down. And horses used to go riding by from a nearby riding stable. And I remember one guy riding by on his horse looking down at me going, what, are you, what exactly are you doing? I was like, oh, I found this fire here. I was just trying to put it out, <laughs> which I'm, I'm sure he didn't buy at all. But that tells you the cycle of abuse that gets perpetuated. There's something wrong with this kid. He's not being treated right. This is an abused child that sets out to do uh, things like this. Um, but mostly I spent the time 
wandering around the trailer park by myself, uh, making friends. Um, and then I remember one night, uh, one day being gone for the entire day on into the night because I was invited to eat a spaghetti dinner over at this nice family's house. They were nice to me. Uh, and then when I went home, my father stood in the driveway and he was waiting for me. And as soon as I showed up, he beat the living shit out of me right in the driveway. I guess I was five or six years old, something like that, uh, for not coming back before sunset. And he had no idea where I was. Not that he cared. He was just worried about getting in trouble with my mother, I think, uh, for not watching me. He didn't care. Uh, and my father was a very terrifying, sadistic individual. I remember that um, he used to make me recite the alphabet backwards. And if I couldn't get it right, he'd slap me upside the head. Later, that probably saved me from a DUI once when I was pulled over and given a, a sobriety test, one of which was to say the alphabet backwards, and I zipped right through it. Thanks to Dad there. Good old Dad. Uh, and uh, I remember him making me lick things up off the kitchen floor. This, my father was a total sadist, uh, forcing me down, my head down, to lick up something that he had spilled, or maybe I spilled. I don't, I don't know what it was. And he'd make me lick it up off the floor uh, when my mom wasn't around because she was always out at night working the, the light shift out at Mo Motorola and, and probably going out having affairs with men. Um, so she was never there. About the only thing... The only good thing I think that came out of this period uh, was my introduction to culture and the arts through my father allowing me to stay up late every night and watch horror movies on the network channels. Back then there was no cable. This was just the big three. Um, and I think it might have been CBS. Every night I was watching one of the 1930s Universal Monster horror movies, uh, either Dracula or Frankenstein or Frankenstein meets the Wolfman or Claude Rains as the Invisible Man, watched all of those wonderful films uh, with him, and uh, that sort of sparked my imagination. And I remember one day being at a 7-Eleven with him. Uh, he would normally just go to convenience stores every night to get his food. Uh, and my father was a sugaraholic. All he ever ate was sugar. That's all I ever see him eat was little packets of powdered white donuts and chocolate milk. Um, he wasn't a drinker and didn't have any other addictions. Well, he smoked. But uh, he was a sugar addict of a very strange diet. And I saw on the magazine rack an issue of Famous Monsters of Filmland. And I asked my father if he would buy it for me. Uh, the chances were not good that he ever would. But on this occasion, he did. So he bought it for me. And I took it home. And I was fascinated with all the images of all the monsters that I had seen on the television. And I started cutting it up and making my own collages and then making my own uh, books by taking typing paper and folding it over and stapling it along the edges then you could open it up, and I'd put my little images in. I'm five years old doing this. And then so comes uh, kindergarten and my first day of school, which is interesting because uh, I guess my father just told me, go up down there to the bus stop or whatever because I was by myself. So I went down to the bus stop, um, and I missed the bus. As I was getting there, I saw it trailing off, big yellow school bus. And I thought to myself, um, no, I'll just walk then. Forget it. I'll just walk. Five years old. Uh, and the school, I knew exactly where it was. Uh, it was up the road about four or five miles, uh, just across from the National Guard there on the intersection of McDowell and uh, <clears throat> McDowell. And I forget the crossroad there. 52nd Street, I think, was the exact location. So it was mostly desert at that time. So I just proceeded to traipse my way uh, through the desert uh, on my way to uh, school. Um, stopping at my aunt's house. Uh, my aunt, by the way, uh, deserves an accolade because out of all these terrifying figures in my life, my aunt was, <laughs> she was great. Totally unconditional love from my aunt. This is my uh, paternal uh, grandmother's sister. Uh, and she, she loved me. Just un unconditional love from her. She was great. Absolutely. Never married. Always lived by herself. And I used to wonder why. And who knows why. She might have been a closet uh, homosexual lesbian. Uh, who knows? We're not sure. She just never hooked up with men. Uh, but she was the most loving individual ever in my life. Always encouraged me. Always encouraged my writing. I started writing in her apartment, you know, clacking away on an electric uh, typewriter. Uh, so that was the first day of school. Um, so you can see the neglect there, but also my individual of independence and autonomy. I think it was already in full swing there. As the result of being a neglected child, I was always having to make my own decisions. Um, so you can see my independence forming right from, from day one. This is a kid who's going to uh, 
you know, be responsible for his own decisions all his life. He's never going to defer to authority or anyone else. Um, you can see that pattern, which is why I, was, I stayed out of academe. I never went in uh, for that kind of uh, consensus, uh, that kind of a trap. Uh, never interested me. Uh, and another day at school, I thought uh, another interesting episode. I remember uh, having a toy rifle. Uh, it was a toy. It looked just like a real rifle uh, back then. And I remember somehow taking it with me to school. I have no idea how I got it there. I must have uh, had it with me on the bus. I'm surprised that the bus driver didn't, you know, say anything. And I took this toy gun with me to school. It was a rifle. And I remember taking it into the classroom with the kids and playing around with it. And they were all fascinated with it. And then finally the teacher found out about it and came over and she took it away. And I was like, well, why'd she take my toy away? That was like my favorite toy. What happened here? So um, that's mostly what happened uh, during the first seven years up to the divorce. So the first seven years then <laughs> concludes with my mother divorcing my father after a, a loveless miserable seven-year marriage with this idiot. Um, and then I think the catalyst for it was my grandfather's suicide. Um, her father, the rocket scientist, at the age of 43, I think, uh, he had already divorced my maternal grandmother and remarried and had an infant uh, child uh, who was only a few months old at the time. Uh, and one night uh, he was standing at the fireplace. We used to drink. He was alcoholic. Another functional alcoholic he used to drink beer every night, all night long, and then get up and do mathematical equations, complex physics uh, all day the next day. I have no idea how these guys did this. Uh, but it caught up with him, and one night uh, he was standing there playing with a gun. He had the revolver. It was a revolver, and he was spinning it, and uh, he just put it to his head and blew, blew his brains out, put a bullet through his head. And uh, it traumatized, of course, everyone, uh, the whole family. And... Um, that was about a year or two, I think. Maybe it was about a year before my mother then divorced from my father. I think that was probably the catalyst. And the whole marriage then fell apart. This is my Saturn square, Saturn first threshold crisis there. And I remember uh, loading up all sorts of helping her load clothes into the trunk of her car, all kinds of objects. And I was obsessed with this question of, does this mean I don't have a dad anymore? And I kept asking her over and over. So I don't have a dad anymore. And she kept saying, no, 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 you're still your father. We're just not going to live with him. Um, and it was very traumatic, even though my father was an asshole from day one to all the way to the end. He's still alive, but he's a total paranoid schizophrenic now. Um, um, he alone is the only one who's still alive out of all these family members. And uh, so we'll pause my autobiography right there with crisis number one at the age of seven, when I apparently had a, didn't have a father anymore and now had to figure out what to do.